So, um, yeah, I actually, I used to work here at ZKM as a full-time uh, software developer, and uh, I'm currently working in <coughs> working for a 3D audio software company called uh, DI Reality um, in Düsseldorf. So in this talk, um, I'd like to discuss UPIC and various other systems alike um, from the perspective of the software development. Uh, introducing some of my related works and experience. Uh, there are actually many overlap with Julian's talk. <laughs> but anyway, so um, roughly speaking, UPIC um, is a system that combines an interactive user interface for notating graphical uh, scores and a sonification engine that uh, interprets these graphics as musical instructions and uh, generates sound based on them. So software for illustrations and sound synthesis are both uh, very common today. However, the combination of these two are still very unique. If somebody asks me to develop a UPIC-like system, I think I have to confront with um, not only technical challenges, but also various software design issues, and they are the subject of this talk. So obviously, it's not possible to discuss all these issues. Um, so I'd like to focus on these three topics today, uh, lines, playheads, and three-dimensionality. The first topic um, is lines. So lines are obviously essential elements of almost all graphics um, and graphic notation. And there are various ways to draw lines with software. So my duty as a software developer here at Setcam was to develop Circonium, um, this software, an application for spatial composition. Um, this software allows users to control movement of multiple sound sources by drawing sound trajectories like this uh, with the busy curves and specialize the sound sources based on the curves in various sound speaker, um, sound speaker setups. Okay. Um, this software is, in one sense, very similar to UPIC uh, because it provides an interface for graphic notation and an audio engine that uh, processes the audio data based on the notation. So by implementing uh, functionalities for drawing lines in the software, I learned various issues and approaches for line drawing. So before um, talking about the details, I'd like to introduce quickly how a computer shows images uh, on a monitor, in case you are not familiar with that. Um, actually, the image on our monitor consists of a tremendous amount of colored dot uh, called pixels, um, and our computer updates them usually 30 to 60 times uh, per second. So if somebody asks me to develop a software that display a line on a monitor, and like this, um, according to the input from the input device, um, such as mouse. My ultimate goal is to implement a functionality to change the color of pixels uh, in response to the input signal from a mouse. However, um, the implementation of this functionality is actually not so simple. I can, for example, change the color of pixels uh, from white to black that the mouse pointer is currently pointing However, if I do so, because a mouse usually reports its current position only 125 times per second, we get some separated dots on a screen if the user moves the mouse very quickly. The simplest solution for this problem is to interpret uh, these points by adding some additional points to fill the gaps. In this way, uh, the software can visualize the trajectory of hand movement of user using a low sample rate input signal. Um, but at this moment, we have already lost significant amount of details uh, of line strokes. However, as far as I can think of, uh, this approach uh, is the simplest and the most uh, straightforward one. So this drawing approach um, is intuitive for most of the users. Uh, since experience is very similar to that of pen and paper. So it is very hard to emulate the experience of a physical drawing with a digital device perfectly. Um, 
The reason uh, why we still sometimes prefer this approach to and paper and high resolution scanner is that we can still apply some primitive manipulations on the drawn lines, such as delete, copy, paste, move, scale, or rotate. However, with this approach, we cannot, uh, we cannot um, access and modify abstract parameters of a line, such as the steepness of a curve, because uh, software just recognizes the line essentially as a collection of interpreted pixels. So um, by changing the approach of the user interaction, we can provide users with more flexible editing experience. For example, uh, we can just ask users to click uh, two points on the screen, and the software just interprets these two points for the user. So in, this, in other words, um, by clicking two points on the screen, the user gives the uh, software essential information to reconstruct a line. In this approach, the software handles more abstract data about line, a line. So in this approach, we can provide users with a way to change the position of two points at a later time uh, so that user edits the line more flexibly. So if we extend this approach, we can very uh, flexibly change many more pro uh, properties of a line. For example, we can add some more joints on a line, uh, modify the steepness of curves, or straighten the line, etc. Um, this approach is useful to draw diagrams or geometric shapes uh, by repeatedly editing already drawn lines. Um, we can improve the quality of graphics quickly even without having a good hand drawing skills. Um, roughly speaking, this is called vector graphics. And Tsukonim also uses this vector graphic approach. So I think um, these two completely different approaches have their own advantages and disadvantages. And the choice between these two approaches may significantly influence how the user interacts with the software and their creative outcomes. This is uh, one of many issues um, that I encountered uh, when I developed Tsukonium. Some composers are satisfied with maximum flexibility of the vector graphics. However, other composers listen to the material sound, material sounds, and want to sketch uh, different spatial gestures uh, by drawing actual uh, lines with their hands. Interestingly, <coughs> the Tsukonium development, development team, including me, and Yannix, uh, development team took the same approach to fulfill uh, the requests from the artist um, by dropping many Bezier control points. So um, both applications attempt to offer a hand drawing experience uh, with the drawback of numerous, actually redundant control points, as you see here. So yet um, another composer uh, requires a perfect spatial trajectory uh, and a spiral, uh, like spiral. But spiral is hard to draw even with a vector approach. And this is where the generative approach comes in. Um, in this approach, we execute even higher level of abst abstract instruction, like draw circle or draw 100 times uh, same line uh, in parallel. So this approach is becoming popular uh, in the field of design. Um, this is a JavaScript-based development environment called P5.js. Uh, this is actually based on processing that support a um, generative approach uh, with 15 lines of code or higher level instructions. I can invoke lower level instructions for drawing circles with different positions, size, and colors. So, as I introduced, we can create lines on a screen in many different ways. Software tools greatly assist us to pro uh, prototype, edit, and even generate lines. Obviously, um, I have no answer which approach is the best for graphical notation or UPIC-like system. 
So it is up to composers and their style of composition. Um, now I'd like to quote a famous statement by um, Xenakis. Uh, he described UPIC system as follows. So um, anybody, even myself or you or children can draw lines or graphics um, with an electromagnetic ball point. And uh, they are transformed by computer directly into sound. So from this quote, uh, what he meant by drawing is neither vector approach nor a generative approach, but more haptic, intuitive, and direct approach, like the simple pen and paper approach that I introduced first. Um, the short study piece that I'm going to present in the concert today is based on the original idea of Xenakis. This uh, video shows a prototype of software that I developed uh, for this piece. Today, um, we have various different tools to draw and edit lines. Um, the software provides us with a greater freedom compared to the original UPIC. My idea is what if I impose myself a very strong limitation, and what if I have no ways to modify lines before the notation is sonificated? In this software, the user is able to freely draw lines on the screen with an input device like the original UPIC, but the lines will be always erased um, by the software within 10 to, uh, 1 to 10 seconds. And at the time of vanishing, it generates sound, or the graphic becomes sound. So if the ultimate purpose of musical score is to preserve uh, musical ideas, motifs, melodies, harmonic progressions, or gestures, these lines do not serve that role at all. Um, in other words, these lines are closer to sound than usual notated lines in a graphic score. Because the notation remains only in our memories, like sound. We can also interpret this system as an instrument um, because the action of the player almost, almost instantly becomes sound. So it is always with a noticeable delay. So what I'd like to explore with this system is to, um, yeah, to explore the border uh, line, border line between these two concepts, score and instrument. Okay. So um, next, I'd like to talk about uh, Prehead. Um, Prehead is a line in the timeline that represents the position of the audio material that is currently being accessed. So this screenshot shows um, the Prehead in a DAW software. We can also find a very similar line in a notation software like uh, not fright, Siberius, or um, Finale. So preheads are usually visualized as a long vertical line uh, in a DW or notator. But we could also use other shapes, um, like a tilted line, um, a curve, a zigzag line, etc. If the shape of prehead is different as shown in the slide, um, we can play the same score in different ways. In other words, uh, these shapes somehow represent uh, the way we interpret the graphics as sounds. So um, this interactive installation um, exhibited uh, in the open course is called Rotating Scores. Um, this installation is a collaborative production uh, with uh, Ludger Bruma, Anto Himstadt, um, Alex Rodriguez and myself. So I'll just play back.
So um, this application allows user to draw free lines, and uh, these lines function as uh, playheads in the system. So they move in the score and generate sound when the line and the objects in the score collide. Uh, we could reach the same score in three different ways, like this. And the variety of um, playhead shapes represent numerous possibilities of interpretation. So, um, multiple playheads. Um, usually, in a DAW software or a notator, we just have one playhead. Um, we can just access uh, only one location of the soft, uh, score, and we cannot access or play two locations of the score at the same time. So there are many musical pieces that were designed to be accessed with multiple playheads, such as Canon. Um, here, I would like to introduce a work of mine uh, called Rhythm of Shapes that extends the idea of multiple playheads further. So this um, installation takes a photo of visitors and extracts the contour of the shape in the photo. Then multiple playheads uh, run across the photo, vertically and horizontally, and when the pixel of the cursors um, and the extracted contour collide, they generate sound. So um, in this software, I use three, four playheads, and each playhead moves independently um, from each other. But we could use more playheads, like a hundred or a thousand. So um, it may sound chaotic. Um, if all of them move in one score and produce sound in response to collision with the object in the score. However, we can give each playhead a parameter like lifetime and remove them when the lifetime of each playhead expires. This idea is very common in the field of computer graphics, and it is called particle effect. So particle effect is often used in order to visualize um, the natural phenomena, such as fire, rain, snow, or explosion. It simulates the movement of numerous points using physical simulation and randomization and each point disappears after a certain amount of time. So this is typical particle effect. Okay. So um, borderlands granular is an example of this approach. Since granular sampling a technique is actually particles in the audio world, Chris Carson, and the developer of borderlands granular, implemented this audiovisual equivalence um, the audio, uh, an audiovisual equivalence in his software. So, so the red point are playheads. If the playheads contact with a waveform behind it, it plays, it plays back um, corresponding sound. Okay. Um, 
The types of preheads um, I introduced until now are preheads with non-dynamic property. Um, on collision with a node or an object, these preheads generate sounds, but they do not change their own property or behavior. For example, speed, um, moving direction, size, etc. But we could also implement this kind of dynamic behavior in our prehead. Small fish is an example of prehead with a dynamic property. So when Bei der Arbeit Small Fish können 15 grafische Partituren in wechselnden Formen arrangiert werden. Was er klingt, ist nicht etwas zufällig Berührtes, sondern eine animierte, visuelle Konzeption. So when the Verstreute abstrakte Formen, oh, Kreise und Punkte, Linien oder farbige, sich bewegende Muster sind die Elemente zur Gestaltung. Small Fish ist ein spielerisches Musikinstrument, ein dynamischer Kunstraum zur Komposition. So, um, this, when the castle or fish cried with the uh, um, object, it changed its direction. It's, so it changed its own property uh, in response to collision. So, um, prehead is an intersection of visual world and audio world and represent how we interpret the graphics um, as sound. In addition to traditional long vertical preheads, we can uh, use curves and um, curves as prehead. Multiple preheads, um, dynamic preheads, or a crowd of preheads. So, as an introduction to the next topic, I'd like to show an iOS app that I developed two years ago here at ZKM. This is an example of three-dimensional preheads. It's a pin. Uh, of the sphere cried with the orange board on the three-dimensional prehead, or the three-dimensional prehead, it generates sound. Okay, the last subject that I'd like to discuss is possibility of three-dimensionality. Today, 3D computer graphic is nothing new, um, especially in the field of animation films, um, CAD, games, or scientific visualization. My question here is, is the use of three-dimensionality beneficial in the field of notation or audio production? So, um, Um, so, speaking of scientific visualization, this 3D representation of sound called waterfall plot is one of relatively old examples that visualizes audio data in a very meaningful way. The waterfall plot basically visualizes a sequence of frequency domain data mapping x axis to frequency, y axis to amplitude, and z axis to time. In this way, this graph is able to visualize the transition of frequency component over a certain period of time. So also in the field of sound specialization, 3D visual representation is useful in order to quickly grasp um, the spatial distribution of multiple sound sources. For a collaborative project between ZCAM and ICSC Zurich, um, I developed Spartative Player in 2017. 
And this software visualizes the speakers, loudspeakers, and the movement of sound sources using, using OpenGL, a 3D graphic library. The green boxes show the position of loudspeakers. Solid orange, blue, pink spheres show the position of sound sources. And the size of transparent uh, sphere uh, surrounding them indicate current loudness of each source. Um, as these two examples demonstrate, um, the visualization of audio data with 3D computer graphics uh, enables us to um, grasp the information quickly and intuitively. However, drawing and editing in the 3D field is much more challenging for us uh, because our user interface, such as mouse, stylus, uh, touch interface is not, are not designed to control objects in a 3D space. It is designed for 2D. So usually 3D modelers, animators, and game developers um, construct virtual 3D characters or sceneries by viewing virtual 3D object from different angles by using multiple virtual cameras. Um, if we want to move this cube in the 3D field, for example, you grab one of three arrows and translate the position of object by accessing one axis at a time. In this way, we can control the position in the virtual 3D world using 2D monitor uh, and input devices. So this is actually very vector graphic-like approach to access 3D world, and it is not like needing clay or drawing with a ballpoint pen, like Xenakis described. So um, also for software of um, audio specialization, we see often this sort of visualization. Uh, this is a Max MSP external GUI object developed at ICST Zurich for ambisonic-based 3D specialization. So this GUI consists of one and a half circles. Um, both of them show the distribution of sound sources in the same 3D space with two cameras placed in different position. One is on top, on the top, and the other is at the back of the sphere. So the advantage of this GUI is that we can very easily edit position of sound sources in a 3D space by usual 2D uh, graphic approach, dragging the point uh, with a mouse. So it is very hard to quickly grasp, uh, grasp uh, where each sound source in 3D space is. So as these two examples show, that to interact with 3D space um, with input device that designed for 2D interaction is not very intuitive. One way to solve this problem is to use an input device that handles information of 3D spaces. For example, Kinect sensor, Intel Real Sense, Leap Motion, or Oculus Touch. So speaking of um, Kinect sensor, this is an old installation of mine uh, being exhibited uh, in the second floor right now. So um, as you might have noticed, this uh, installation is inspired by the waterfall plot. Um, the installation basically visualizes the sound created by generative algorithms um, in real time using the 3D waterfall plot. Um, this installation also allows visitors to interact with the plot directly. And when your 3D model or avatar visualizes as a point cloud um, in real time, touches the uh, virtual square, or playhead in front of your model, you can generate a sound with different pitch and loudness based on your hand position. So in this way, this installation summarizes the relationship between us um, and time by means of sound. The spectrum below the bar chart, um, so maybe I just play back again, below the, uh, the spectrum below the virtual floor shows um, the sound of the future. The spectrum above the virtual floor depicts the sound of the past. 
Um, but you can interfere the spectrum by touching the panel or the uh, playhead that represent now. So Kinect sensor captures the entire 3D field. Um, it is a sort of video camera that records the depth of scenery. And it is not the 3D version of the mouse. The mouse equivalent in a 3D space could be the VR controller, such as Oculus Touch or Vive controller. So a VR system provides us with a way to interact with a virtual 3D space, mapping the virtual space on top of a physical space. The video except shows um, part of outcome um, of the artist in residence program conducted by Google Cultural Institute. So they invited 60 artists um, and let them draw pictures or build statues in the VR field. So, and what if we put a playhead um, in this 3D space and sonificate the object and the statues in the 3D space? Maybe in this case, the playhead should not be a line, but a 2D plane, as in my installation, or in Yannick's. Um, then how should we map X, Y, and Z axis to the musical parameters? Um, how big is the playhead should be? There are many poss uh, possibilities and questions. So a visual artist who participates in this uh, Google Artist in Residency program answered in the interview that two-dimensionality is already a big problem and three-dimensionality add more problems. But um, if you put the idea of uh, music notation in 3D aside and focus on practical advantages of the interaction in a 3D space for audio creation, I believe immersive sound design and special composition gains a significant benefit from the VR. What I'm developing with a team at DR Reality, um, a 3D audio specialization software company in Düsseldorf is called Special Connect. So using the VR technology, a sound designer are able to specialize multiple sound sources and its movement in a VR space using VR controllers as a visual artist did. This is a quick demo of the software. Having a tool like this right now really facilitates us to not be able to only uh, solve problems, but actually be able to work creatively. Hi, my name is Christian. I'm a sound engineer, software developer, and co-founder of Dear Reality. We create advanced 3D audio technology. As a sound engineer, I believe mixing 3D audio for VR, you have to be in VR. So we created a great tool for any audio workstation to connect to the VR world. Usually you're controlling your mix with faders or with your mouth. But now we have a completely new workflow. You're, you're allowed to, to mix with your hands. So, um, the sound trajectory of the sound sources drawn by the sound designer or an artist in the VR space are sent to a VST plugin running on DAW software, such as Reaper or Pro Tools using OSC protocol. So as soon as the plugin receives an OSC message, it stores the movement of sound as automation curves in the DAW software and processes the sound materials um, in the in the um, respective channel using an HRTF algorithm instantly. So that the sound designer can monitor instantly the spatial audio effect uh, that the trajectory realizes uh, only wearing usual headphones. So this software is developed mainly for the sound design or VR films, but it can also be used for the specialization of acousmatic music. So strictly speaking, Spatial Connect is not a complete notation system. That actual data uh, for changing sound properties are stored in the DAW tracks, and this could be interpreted as the actual score of the specialization. 
Special Connect just provides more accessible ways or three-dimensional user interface to interact with uh, sound positions using VR technology. But I think this is one of the convincing examples um, uh, to use three-dimensionality for audio creation. So in this talk, um, I focused on these three topics and discussed the technical and artistic challenges behind them. Today, um, we have many different approaches for even draw drawing lines, uh, such as raster, vector, and generative. The choice of drawing approaches may significantly influence both visual and audio results. We can create and use various kinds of playheads um, that represent the intersection of the visual world and audio world. This is a very challenge, um, challenging problem for the system that process time-based events. Um, various software have implemented different kinds of experimental prefet. So enhanced uh, interactive experiences uh, in a three-dimensional space by VR and AR technologies could be a new frontier for both visual and sound artists, though some practical application of three-dimensionality um, in the field of audio production are being attempted. And there's still a large uh, space to explore. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chikashi Miyama, for this very great outlook into the future, which <laughs> uh, yeah, appears to happen just now. So, um, great continuation of this um, ideas of Yanis Xenakis. So now I'm curious whether you have some questions. Yes, I will just have to get a microphone. Um, thank you for your very interesting uh, talk. Um, you mentioned many uh, possibilities and many devices. Uh, and at one, uh, you showed the Mona Lisa at once uh, with pixelized. And uh, this reminds me of a, a software I often use, which, is, uh, which uses uh, Mona Lisa as uh, an example. And uh, in that kind of uh, software, uh, the, the image is transformed into MIDI data. And uh, the drawback is that uh, it's linear. It's read from top to bottom and from left to right. So it's, uh, uh, it makes um, uh, repetitions. Every line is uh, normally uh, observed. Uh, but with some uh, different design, it can be uh, very productive. You probably know this uh, device an American one. I don't remember the, the name of the software. But if, uh, uh, whether you know it or not, what do you think about such an approach which instead of uh, synthesizing uh, uh, sounds from lines, whatever they are, uh, takes a ready-made image and try to analyze it? Uh, um, I mean, it, it uh, works uh, uh, as I did with UPIC. Uh, Mm -hmm. upside down. Yeah, this is also possible, like uh, my um, installation analyzes the contour of image, and but I actually took the approach to just lead from left to right. But it's possible to um, analyze further and extract these lines as a real busy line, so just analyze this line start from there and end there, then we can get this data, abstract data, and <laughs> Um, we can just put prehead on top of that uh, line. That's also possible. Yeah, then the, the main problem is to transform uh, space into time yes. and to uh, fix rules for this transformation. Yeah. That's the main thing. Yeah. But yes, it's a problem, of course, but uh, there are many different approaches to put um, um, this time axis inside a graphic, right? So um, there, you can put many, um, many preheads inside. 
then you can have many time, different timelines, for example. Yeah, there are many different interpretations of time in graphic, I guess. Yes, but, but probably I'm not <laughs> answering your question, but... That was very, very interesting for me. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Are there more questions from the audience? And I would like to ask, all, in all these approaches, also by Mxenakis, you pick time is considered actually linear, that it flows in one direction. So I want to ask, are there any approaches that considers time in a different paradigm that is not flowing in a linear fashion? Sorry, the last sentence I didn't understand. Uh, is there any approaches or any, maybe it's a philosophical question, if time doesn't flow in one direction, so any computational approaches or any implementation that considers time not in this traditional manner that starts <laughs> one direction and then goes in one another direction. Do, do you have any that kind no, of no, approach? No, no. <laughs> Why do you ask? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, um, no, I have no answer, but uh, time is a um, very kind of big problem when I use a three-dimensionality, I guess. And I think that two-dimensional score, we, if we use, graphical score, which we use, an x-axis is kind of automatical time, I think. Mm -hmm. it's, we can um, think based on the traditional musical score, like left to right, and time sh uh, x-axis is time, but if we are in the three-dimensionality, then there is no such uh, kind of base, common sense, and then, yeah. Or we to use this kind of hyperbolic geometry, like Esser's drawings, you know, where there is, it's not a yeah. Cartesian. Did you try something like that? Or? Nowhere, sorry. What? Did you try to implement a kind of geometrical space that represents time, mm -hmm. which is not a Euclidean, that is more like, a, I don't remember the name, a, Mathematics, how they call this? Well, no, I mean, no, it's older. I mean, like the Esther's drawing, you know, where it's infinite on the sides and it, it's like a, a curve. Recursive? Not recursive. Yeah, anyway, maybe we can discuss <laughs> on private. Hmm? The topology, it also has spaces, you have spa uh, shapes in the topolo topological spaces. Well, different kinds of geometry, because we are thinking mostly in the Euclidean, Cartesian mm -hmm. paradigm, mm -hmm. but there are also mathematically other geometries where we treat space totally mm -hmm. differently. And maybe there is an idea that we can treat, if we represent time with space, and maybe we can have a different geometry for the space, then time can be also applied. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I somehow idea. understand what you're okay. trying to say. Yeah. Um, for the um, problem of um, three-dimensional so it's kind of related problem I'd like to introduce here is uh, that we are um, uh, so developing this three-dimensional special um, specialization software, and the point is we can only have three dimension, and mm -hmm. uh, we can't notate in three-dimensional space the time somehow. So then that's a, of course we can kind of um, you know uh, notate the trajectory and stuff, but mm -hmm. three dimensionality is not enough for you know. <laughs> not eight, three-dimensional data. And you yeah. can go higher dimensional? Yeah, how? <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah, I need fourth dimension yeah. to complete the notation. OK, yeah, you <laughs> have to make it visible. That's the problem, right? Yeah, maybe just, <laughs> yeah, I want to see the time also. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah. So are there more questions? Then, okay. thank you very much for thank this uh, presentation, Chikashi. Um, so make sure you be back at two. Uh, we will have uh, another symposium session. Um, so I wish you good appetite. <laughs>